Uh, good afternoon. Welcome back to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to uh, uh, fill out the attendance record and also please remember to fill out the program evaluations and if you could give us any ideas in regards to future speakers and future topics, the CME committee is always appreciative of those ideas. Uh, today it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Warmy. Dr. Warmy is an orthopedist and also a sports medicine specialist. Uh, he did his orthopedic training at the University of Iowa and uh, did his uh, shoulder and sports medicine training at the Hospital for Special Surgery in uh, New York. He's uh, here uh, uh, to discuss uh, hip arthroscopy, femoral acetabular impingement, and beyond. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Warming. Thanks, everybody, for uh, spending your lunch hour with me. Uh, this uh, is meant to be interactive and meant to uh, help answer what questions you guys have about this stuff. Uh, hip arthroscopy is a, a fairly new thing and, and hopefully uh, you'll get something out of uh, what we do today. My goal is to help you guys understand part of part of my practice is hip arthroscopy and, and hopefully you'll understand more about that. Um, it's a an exciting field that's growing really fast and um, I think hopefully by the end of this uh, discussion you'll have bought into the idea of hip arthroscopy and what I can do for uh, athletes. So um, this is the hospital where I learned how to do hip arthroscopy. It was uh, in New York, like uh, Dr. Hallberg said. Dr. Kelly was my mentor there in hip arthroscopy. So that's where I've been. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I grew up in Ames, and this is my hometown, mm -hmm. and I'm thrilled to be back and uh, plan to be here for, for my career. I'm excited to to join uh, the other ortho uh, members of my department and hope to be here for a long time. So that's where I've been. Um, on, a, on a side note, sort of one of the things that Dr. Buck and Greenwald and the other guys recruited me back to do is help build up the sports medicine program here. And so my uh, long-term goal is to really build up the Iowa State sports medicine stuff and um, McFarland Clinic and Mary Greeley Medical Center will be a big part of that. Uh, I hope to turn Ames into a uh, a hub of sports medicine, so to speak. So, uh, let's very generally, there are about a thousand things that can cause hip pain in an athlete. And uh, today I'm going to focus on one, one of those, and that's uh, labral pathology and femoral acetabular impingement. I think of all those things that you see on the screen there, uh, labral tears uh, and femoral acetabular impingement are probably 90% of uh, the the causes of hip pain in athletes, and furthermore, it's something that we can treat very well at this point. A lot of these other things are uh, esoteric uh, conditions that are, are sometimes difficult to treat, but I think that uh, hopefully you'll agree with me by the end of this that uh, we do have good treatment for uh, labral tears and uh, hip impingement. So uh, the bottom line for uh, hip impingement and labral tears, I'll use my mouse here to point. Here is the labrum here. This is a what we call a pincer lesion. This is bone uh, that has broken off. And this is what we call a cam lesion. And so there's two terms that we'll use that you'll, you'll see a lot in hip arthroscopy. One is the cam lesion, which is this. And the other is the pincer lesion, which is this. So the pincer lesion is on the socket side or the acetabulum. Then the cam lesion is on the femoral side at the femoral head neck junction. What the cam lesion is, is this white line kind of shows you what a normal femoral head neck offset should look like. This femoral head should be a, a sphere and then there should be a transition into the neck. But if there's a bump that makes this aspherical, when this patient abducts and hip flexes, uh, you can imagine how this will bump into this and the structure between that is the cartilage of the articular surface as well as the labrum. So that's how we, that's really the basis of femoral acetabular impingement is crushing of the soft tissues, uh, that is the labrum and the, the cartilage between this pincer lesion and this cam lesion. So the most important two slides are these next two slides I'm gonna show you. This is, uh, you know, basically, uh, for the lay physician to know or the lay person, you can see how these femoral heads are not spherical and there's extra bone out here. So this is just a simple AP pelvis that, that you can see it on. 
if you look really closely, I don't know how well it projects, but um, there is sclerosis here, and there's actually a little divot there. Same thing over here, sclerosis with a little divot, where that is impinging up here on the acetabulum. Uh, so that's the cam lesion. This is uh, what the pincer lesion looks like, and, and the best way for me to diagnose a pincer lesion radiographically is uh, with what we call the crossover sign. So this is the anterior wall of the acetabulum, and this is the posterior wall, the dotted line. Normally, the anterior wall comes up and the posterior wall meet uh, out laterally at the, at the socket, but when the, this pincer lesion grows down over the femoral head, then it comes down further, and then you get this crossover sign. So typically, this line would come up here and meet there, but this is extra. This is all extra bone in the anterior uh, wall of the acetabulum. So that's what I refer to as the crossover sign. And then this is uh, the cam lesion. I'm going to jump out of this and um, show you a, a video of each. So this is the cam lesion. So before I, we jump into that, let me tell you also that in general, uh, cam deformities are more common in men and pincer lesions are more common in women. Um, why is that? We're not 100% sure, but um, I think part of the geometry of the female pelvis and accommodating uh, a birth canal does sometimes give you added overcoverage here. In men with the uh, the cam lesion, there is some thought that that uh, kids growing up playing hockey five hours a day, five days a week for years and years on end, and in the same light, uh, soccer players growing up and playing soccer, you know, every day, all through childhood, that can can put some stress on the physis. Uh, and cause a subtle subclinical slip capital femoral epiphysis, which causes the head to be out of round. So the, we don't know that for sure, but that is one um, proposed uh, mechanism. And I, I, I do tend to believe with that, uh, especially on, on the, the cam side. So this is a cam, this is a, a cartoon of a cam lesion. You'll see that this is a normal sphere now, and then pretty soon this is gonna grow out, and then it'll show you with hip flexion what happens to the labrum. So there's the cam lesion. Now it's no longer spherical. And when this cartoon flexes its hip up, it crushes uh, the labrum in here. So I'm just going to stop it right there. And you can imagine at surgery, if I can decompress this bone here and make this more of a sphere and then take away this offset, that that's going to take away that impingement. So we'll show pictures of that later. So this structure, this triangle structure right here is the labrum, and then underneath it and adjacent to it is the articular cartilage. The labrum is easy to fix uh, through the scope. The articular cartilage is difficult to fix uh, with the scope, uh, similar to the knee or the shoulder. So this depicts the labral injury. This depicts the uh, underlying uh, articular cartilage that gets injured by this cam lesion. So that's the cam. So that is this. Now we'll do the pincer. So here you'll see the acetabular socket grow. So that's over coverage. And much like the cam, the structure that gets crushed between this pincer and the femoral neck is this labrum. So this is more typically the, the scenario that we see in, in women. So you can imagine uh, at surgery, if, if I can remove this bone and then put the labrum back down here, that will remove this impinging pincer lesion and, and uh, correct the pain.
There is some cartilage damage uh, in pincer lesion as well. And then there's this levering effect off of the pincer where you can get similar to a concussion in the brain where you get a counter coup lesion. You can get a counter coup lesion on the back of the acetabulum in the wall in this pincer because of this levering effect on the front of the socket. So in the cam type, you have a lot of injury here and here, and then the pincer, it's a little bit more of a global injury. So really, my two take-home slides for you guys today is this picture of these cam bumps and this crossover sign, which is a radiographic representation of this pincer lesion. So, you know, is our labral tears a big deal? Well, this is what we think uh, is one of the major leading causes of idiopathic arthritis in the 60-year-old person down the line is they previously had a labral tear, they previously had impingement. We suspect that uh, this is the most common reason uh, for idiopathic arthritis at a later stage in life. And so if we can treat the, the labral injury and this impingement early on, say under, under the age of 40 before the arthritis really sets in, um, there could be a big benefit later on in life, not only the acute pain that I treat at surgery, but down the line, hopefully delaying or, or pushing back the onset of uh, arthritis. So <clears throat> the, uh, historically, impingement was treated through an open incision, uh, as depicted here on the left, a big open approach, and then a trochanteric osteotomy, and then a hip dislocation. So you had to saw this, this part of the the femur off to get access to this head and neck, and then you actually had to dislocate the hip. So uh, that's a fairly traumatic uh, procedure that has lots of risk involved, including avascular necrosis and other damage to the soft tissues. That's opposed to uh, what we're able to do today with two poke holes to put our scope in, which is this one, and then our instrument in, we're able to do the same thing. And so we've made it uh, much, much less invasive, um, easier to recover from, uh, more benign to the patient, and also more predictable as far as uh, outcome. So I think that the event of hip arthroscopy is a big step forward um, in the treatment of uh, hip impingement. So I'm going to run through a case to kind of, as we go through uh, the talk, and, and the, the, talk, the, the title of my talk was Hip Arthroscopy, Impingement, and Beyond. And the beyond part of that really is what's what 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 is beyond the hip and what does hip impingement affect downstream and upstream of the hip so the hip is one of the centers of the uh the kinetic chain it's really the center of your core as close as you get to the center of the core along with the uh, lumbar spine and so impingement in the hip does affect things downstream knees ankles and it also affects things upstream uh low back shoulders elbows and, I, and hopefully by the end of the talk you'll appreciate the, uh, the effect of impingement on those uh, downstream and upstream joints in that kinetic chain. So this is a 23-year-old uh, offensive lineman uh, in the NFL, and he presented to us with an ACL injury. Um, and by us, I, I'm speaking of my uh, year last year in fellowship, and uh, he had a non-contact pivoting injury. Uh, it, it, turned out to be an ACL, so he presented to one of the knee specialists where I did my fellowship. But as part of that workup, he, he had mentioned that he had had four years of bilateral groin pain. And so that uh, brings up an important point of where uh, labral pathology usually presents itself. It's usually in the groin. So the pain that's up here in athletes is something that usually is something that I can help. Um, pain out here is uh, usually bursitis, pain in the back, and in the buttock is usually nerve-related sciatica and that type of thing. So the three big areas where patients have pain are groin, side, and deep in the buttock. And then right in the midline is uh, more, more typical of a groin, so or more typical of a, uh, a hernia. But this uh, particular athlete uh, had described groin pain for the last three or four years on both hips. And this is very subtle, but when we worked him up, I, I think you can see that this is 
this particular projection shows that this head is not spherical and it's fairly flat on this side. And much like that picture I was showing you before, there is sclerosis here and a little divot uh, where this is impinging on this pin. This cam is hitting this pincer uh, every time this guy flex. So <clears throat> why is this important to uh, the ACL? Well, hip impingement blocks your ability to internally rotate. So that is going this way. And so with this patient, he had a a uh, planted leg and it was a non-contact injury, you can imagine if he was hit and unable to internally rotate that hip this way, then that force does not get dissipated by the hip and it goes through the knee, makes you more susceptible to ACL tears. So um, that is starting to be proven in the literature and the research that hip impingement does make you more likely to have an ACL tear. Um, and so that's why I bring this into this, uh, this conversation here. So. Um, what did this patient's exam, what was his exam like? He had pain with straight flexion like this and then uh, the most predictable test, physical exam maneuver for hip impingement is having the hip at 90 degrees and the knee at 90 degrees and then internally rotating the leg. That gives me an idea of how much there's, a, I, I refer to this sort of as the hips version of the Lachman test. So in the knee we we find out where the, the ACL stops us from translating the, the tibia forward. Here, the, this impingement will stop me from internally rotating the hip. And uh, usually about 25 degrees or more is normal. And if you have less than that, then that is suggestive of impingement. This guy had 10 degrees on both sides. <clears throat> and then uh, a scour maneuver is where you hyperflex and internally rotate beyond that. And if that re reproduces the pain that they have in the groin, that is very uh, suspicious of a hip impingement and labral pathology. So very, I would, I would argue this is very subtle, but, but real, you can see the sclerosis and that little dimple, sclerosis in the dimple there. His, uh, exam is, uh, is confirming for that. And again, you don't see much on these straight x-rays. Uh, the reason for that is, is that the impingement and the cam lesion is usually in the front of the hip and not on the sides of the hip. So his cam lesions are here and not here. And so if we back up to this one, you can, you can see, if you can see the cam lesion on an AP view, that suggests that it is either really big or it's more lateral than what it typically is. It typically is up in front. So uh, the CT is very useful and it helps us uh, with our preoperative planning. Uh, this is the area of the cam lesion. You can see how that's in the front of the hip and not up here on the sides. But you can see this. This is where it was uh, impinging right here. And this is uh, the, the divot that we saw on these x-rays. He did not have much of a uh, pincer lesion, which is normal. Um, this structure here is called the ASIS. There's uh, several muscles uh, and a ligament that attach there. This structure here is called the AIIS, the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is where the uh, one of the heads of the rectus tendon inserts. This is uh, in profile, you get to see that. And you can imagine there's this thing called subspine impingement, where if this grows down far like it has here, you can imagine that this also bumps into that cam lesion. So this uh, impingement here is called subspine impingement. Impingement here is the classic femoral acetabular impingement. So there's two subsets of impingement. One is the cause of this spine, and the other is where the cam hits the pincer lesion. So just really briefly to speak the language, uh, I, I call superior in the socket 12 o'clock, uh, and then medial uh, is 3 o'clock, and inferior is 6 o'clock. Most of the uh, pincer lesions and the cam lesions are between this 12 and 3 o'clock area. This is a picture of what a subspine should look like in comparison to this large overgrown structure here. So here is the 12 to 3 o'clock region uh, of the socket. This is a side view looking in. This is looking down on the fem femoral head. And here is anterior here, posterior here. And this is where the cam lesions usually are. And, and usually it's about the 130 position where we see the biggest bump. 
and about the 130 position here where we see the biggest bump on the socket side. So this labrum here and this articular cartilage here, those are the areas that are injured the most and the most susceptible to injury. So you can see here he has this cam lesion. These are measurements that we take that are, are not the uh, goal of today's topic, but this is another way that we can measure the cam lesion. Um, for him, it, it, it's very subtle, but this angle should be less than 55. And if it's greater than 55, then by radiographic definition, that is a cam deformity. And basically what this measurement does is proves that this head is not spherical. I'm going to um, go through these so that we can. I'll, I'll just uh, leave to say that the, the, the pelvis and the acetabulum is a three dimensional structure. There's tilt to it and there is version to it. It's not straightforward. In my mind, it's a three dimensional structure uh, more so than what a knee or a shoulder is, especially when we think about it arthroscopically. Uh, the shoulder, we can think of the chromium being flat, and that's your horizon, the glenoid being straight up and down and that's one side of your, uh, your equation. The knee, your tibial plateau is completely flat, and so you have good references and landmarks, and with a sphere, you don't have those, and so it makes these uh, understanding the deformities and understanding inversion and tilt and all those things uh, more important uh, to uh, working that up. And I think that, in my mind, there's two reasons why hip arthroscopy didn't take off along with knee arthroscopy and shoulder arthroscopy that arthroscopy really started in the knee and, and that's because the knee is very superficial it's easy to get into and then it went to the shoulder because that was the next easiest uh, joint really to get into. The hip is a deep structure that has lots of uh, neurovascular structures and muscles and tendons all in this area that are vital to the leg and so it's and then it's, a, it's difficult to get into the hip because uh, the hip is such a constrained joint. So figuring out techniques um, to overcome those things has what, is what has led to a hip arthroscopy, but those are the things that make it more challenging and more difficult and not mainstream part of uh, resident education. Here's another picture of the, uh, the cam. So this is a spherical head. So this angle would be less than 45. Here, this is not spherical. This is the cam lesion, and this is greater than 55. So um, that's a cartoon of that measurement. So here is our measurement on our athlete. His cam lesion was actually about 90 degrees. There was a study done. Uh, this is important more for the radiologist that, sh that shows which x-rays best can identify cam lesions, and really it's the these special x-rays here that we do, and uh, I've been working with the people over at McFarland trying to sort of hone our protocols for that to really be able to get the right x-ray so that we can really see where that bump is. But this AP it does underestimate that basically because the cam lesion is usually in the front of the hip and not out on the side. So back to the case. Uh, Here's the knee that had the ACL tear. Uh, first thing we did was fix the ACL. Uh, in NFL athletes, we favor a bone patella tendon bone. At least in my fellowship, that's what we favored uh, for more predictable healing. So that's why we have uh, radio opaque screws that we can see. So after that was fixed, then sequentially in, in three week intervals, we uh, fixed his hips as well. He was going to be out for the rest of the season on IR. We had a, a, a good window to fix his hip pain and to prevent him from getting arthritis down the road. So here's before and after pictures. So on the right hip, you know, here's this flat line, here's this sclerosis and that little divot, and then here's after we kind of carved that out. And you can imagine now if he adducts, or sorry, abducts his hip, that he's not going to hit that as much. Same thing on the left side, flat with sclerosis. Now he's got that, what I would refer to as sort of an apple core lesion where there's a nice smooth slope there on both the top and the bottom as opposed to being straight on top and then having the apple core on just the undersurface and not on the upper surface. So that's really the goal. When I'm in surgery, I try and recreate this apple core. This is what he looked like uh, from an arthroscopic perspective. This is the big pincer lesion. This is labrum here. This is socket and pincer. So this is after we took down the pincer lesion. Um, 
it's a little bit difficult to make out his labral tear, but this labrum was torn all the way across here. So that's fixed with three sutures there and drilled into the bone, into the socket side with anchors. Um, this is a picture of the cam deformity before we took it out. These are different projections and I apologize for that. So it's hard to, uh, get your mind's eye around this, but, um, this is the part that we carved out here. And now we're looking at it from the side and you can see this is the part that was carved out. Here's the labrum, labral repair. Here's the cam lesion. Now put the camera here, look up the neck like this. That gives you this picture where here was the cam lesion. Here was the pincer lesion. Here is the fixed labrum. And under arthroscopy, we can take the foot out of uh, traction and then flex the hip up and prove that this area here does not impinge on this area or the labrum. So I'm going to uh, play a video here quick, just give you a better idea of what it looks like. So this is of a right hip, um, and like I was mentioning before, we have to pull traction in order to get the uh, hip distracted. So this is labrum, this is the articular cartilage, here's the, a pincer lesion on the socket, the subspine area is up in this area, and then the femoral head is out here, and we, I've got about a centimeter of distraction on the hip uh, this, that we need in order to get inside the hip to do our work. So at this point, it becomes uh, somewhat like a uh, slap tear in the shoulder where we clean off, in the shoulder, we clean off the, the glenoid in order to place uh, anchors and repair the, the glenoid's labrum. Here, we're cleaning the soft tissue off. You can see how much uh, erythema is in this labrum where it's been torn. So this pincer is hitting that cam. This is a 5.5 burr that we use to, to decompress the pincer lesion flatten that out. So this is sort of the subspine area up here, just taking this down. So this is after we've done the pincer decompression. I'm going to go back up just a little bit. So this is the psoas tendon right here. Um, and that corresponds in this patient to a lot of erythema over this labrum. So a snapping hip or a, what the, the, the medical term for that is coxa saltans. Uh, there's an internal form of that, which is this, when the, the psoas tendon snaps over the labrum. So that you can see this is what coxa saltans looks like in the hip, where this psoas tendon is snapping over with external rotation and flexion. It causes uh, erythema and injury there. So that's a little bit farther down the socket, more towards the 3 o'clock side, whereas the typical pincer lesion, and this is more at the uh, 1 o'clock or, or 12 o'clock area. As this video keeps playing, you'll see more and more of this labral tear underneath of it. So this is all torn labrum. that can, we can I can put a uh, probe behind it and completely take it off of the socket. This is pretty typical for me. I put, usually put three anchors in for my labral repairs. Um, I use a, a knotless anchor and knotless repair because you can imagine if I was tying knots, I would be leaving tails that would be affecting, it would be exposing this capsule and this tissue that's already irritated from the impingement. So I think that the uh, knotless anchor systems are really have a, a, just a clear use here over the, uh, the knotted anchor system. So this is a special device to pass suture around the torn labrum. You can see more and more that this is where we have this area of tear where I could completely, this could completely come off of the underlying uh, articular cartilage on the socket. So what's the goal? The goal here is to fix this labrum take away the impingement. So fixing the labrum takes away their acute pain. And then fixing the impingement is what hopefully prevents this from recurring, number one. And number two, uh, over time, if we can take away that impingement, we think that we can delay the onset of arthritis because, I'll show you here in just a second. So this is the, uh, the fixation we use.
So it's just cutting the tails, and this again is an analysis system, so there are no tails. So you can see up here where the labrum is back up on the socket, and you can imagine how this labrum has not only been torn, but it's also been pushed down into the joint. So as this repair goes on, this labrum will be pushed back up to where it belongs, up along the rim of the acetabulum. So you can see as we go that this is revealing a, a larger tear. So this is the labral chondral junction between the labrum and the articular cartilage. And you can see how this is starting to delaminate and kind of come off like a sheet of ice. That's really the, the part that worries me the most about uh, the, the risk of developing arthritis down the road is what happens to this. And, and the earlier we can fix impingement, the sooner we can prevent this from progressing farther. So this is the part I think that you know the labrum plays a role, plays a significant role, but that's something that we can fix. It's difficult in 2013 right now to fix this chondral injury. I'll, sh I'll kind of give you an idea of, of what I do to, to help that, but that's the next really frontier in hip arthroscopy is trying to figure out how to treat these labr these uh, chondral injuries down here. So you can see how that labrum lifts off and really isn't attached to the socket. And by placing these sutures, then we've got it back. And then the other thing that decompressing that pincer lesion is, is it freshens up that bone so it provides a good healing surface. Now this is articular cartilage here, and you can see how it's just coming off in sheets. And once it comes off like that, there's really nothing we can do except for, for clean it up. And by clean it up, I mean debriding it and taking away good cartilage. Um, the one thing that we can do if this is a full thickness cartilage loss is we can do microfracture, uh, but just like in the knee or the shoulder for that matter, uh, microfracture is not totally predictable and that's a, a uh, technique where we punch holes into the underlying bone and get the marrow elements and the bone elements to bleed so you get clotting factors and growth factors and the marrow elements to try and fill that area that it has lost our articular cartilage to fill back up with a uh, more robust cartilage hyaline-like fibrocartilage. So there's not really a good answer for that if this becomes full thickness. And so it's really important for us to, to work on these hips before they get to that point. So that's the final picture of that one. And then for that, uh, the psoas, we can just, at the uh, level of the joint where you saw the psoas tendon, that's only about, uh, constitutes about 20% of the psoas tendon. And so we can release that there with relative impunity and not worry about the hip flexor muscle, the psoas um, being weak once that heals up. So that's a good way to uh, fix that snapping hip, especially if that's causing pain and labral injury. So that is hip arthroscopy and, and what I try and do with the labrum and the impingement. Um, the, now I get on a little bit into the, uh, the, to wrap up my talk, just to talk about hip arthroscopy and beyond. So beyond what I mean by that is the knee, the ankle, the shoulder, the back, the hip. Um, I mentioned before that there is an increased risk of ACL injury if you do have femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, papers that uh, has has proven that. Uh, a lot of the a lot of that literature comes out of the Brazilian literature and the South American literature in uh, soccer players. And they have uh, shown that if you have hip impingement, you're li more likely to have an ACL tear. Um, and I hope that I've kind of explained that to you. They're, they're also showing that in the ankle that you're more likely to have ankle sprains and that kind of thing. It, it's a little bit far-fetched, but if you can just imagine if you don't have rotation at the center of your core, your knees, your ankles, those things have to rotate more to accommodate for the lack of motion at your hip. Uh, in the back, there's a phenomenon called uh, a, PARS defects or stress fractures, and that literature is starting to come out now, and it hasn't been published yet, but I'll tell you that uh, in the next 10 years, I think that you'll see this uh, be uh, proven, is that uh, if you don't have motion in your hips, you're going to put, athletes especially, are going to put more stress in their low back for twisting and movement 
You can imagine that applies to baseball with uh, swinging the baseball bat as well as golfers and any kind of a swinging sport. If you don't have a lot of motion through your hips in order to generate power, you're going to have to have more torque placed on your low back. Um, so there's, there's no doubt in my mind that we'll see that being played out. The other place that, that we've seen it and um, where I did my fellowship, they are enrolling patients into a study now is in the elbow. So in uh, high level pitchers, this is again far fetched, but bear with me on it. If in high level pitchers, if you're right handed, your lead leg when you're coming off the mound is your left leg. And as part of that torque and creating your power and your energy to throw your fastball, you have to rotate around your hip. And this rotation right here is basically internal rotation of the hip. And so as you're creating your torque and your power through your hip, which is most more where the majority of your power comes in throwing, if you can't rotate through there, that uh, decreases your ability to generate power. So what does that do? The, the athlete compensates by putting more torque through the shoulder, more torque through the elbow. So they have to create a, a greater valgus stress at the elbow in order to get the fastball up into the 90s where they want it to be. Um, what am I going, where am I going with this? That, that where I'm going is, is that there, we think that there is a relationship between hip impingement and having Tommy John or ulnar collateral ligament injury. And, uh, we operated on, on three Mets player, Mets pitchers last year who had previously undergone Tommy John surgery in their farm system. And we're, we're seeing us uh, for the groin pain. And we think that, uh, that this will help that too. So it's a bit far fetched and I, I might be sounding like I'm talking like the hip is the center of the orthopedic world, which I don't necessarily believe. Um, but there is a lot that we don't know in all the joints. And I think that there's a, a huge room for growth in our knowledge and our skill set as orthopedic surgeons uh, with the hip. So um, I guess the one thing I, I should emphasize is that uh, the goal with hip arthroscopy is to, to, to delay or to prevent arthritis. And in, in the older patient who has impingement but who also has arthritis, unfortunately, is not a good candidate for hip arthroscopy because you can imagine if, uh, if I improve their range of motion and I can't treat that underlying arthritis, the impingement that they have and the osteophytes that their body has formed as part of the arthritis process is an effort to slow down the arthritis. And if I take those away, things can accelerate and it's kind of a slippery slope. So I try and get patients uh, at or before the age of 40 in general. That being said, if, the, if there's a 65 year old who uh, has no articular cartilage loss, um, you know, I think that they may be a candidate for hip arthroscopy. So that's an important point too, that once arthritis is set in, impingement is almost a, a, a protective thing that your body does by creating ossifice and whatnot to prevent movement in the hip, to prevent shear stress on your, your cartilage. Um, mm. And so in that case, I typically don't offer hip arthroscopy to, to someone over 40 unless with MRIs and extensive workup, they don't have much arthritis or, or none at all. So anyway, I hope you guys learned something. What, this is for you guys. So what questions do you have? What can I answer? You guys are all pros. Yeah, go ahead. So having had this done, can you touch on how long recovery actually is? Because we talk about how it's a better surgery, and I definitely agree with that. But um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is how long the recovery really is from it. Sure. Um, the return to play for athletes is is as a rule six months so it takes you know up to three months for the labrum to heal back down to the uh, socket and then uh, a lot of muscle retraining for your core uh, after that um, in my experience uh, so post-operatively I have my patients on crutches for two weeks and with 50 percent weight bearing and the majority of those patients feel better all right away after surgery and, and by the time they see me they're ready to get off their crutches uh, at the two-week period and they already feel better than what they did before surgery but um, return to play is you know you need to take the whole the whole season off in order to allow that labrum to heal there are various ways of doing that uh, the hip arthroscopy and if you take if you cut the capsule and then repair that that adds to the uh, the healing time too so I would say that in general most of my patients are feeling really good um, within about two weeks or so. Um, but it is, if you do a microfracture or you do a capsule repair, that slows things down. 
Um, and then to retrain your muscles to get back to running, sprinting, cutting, it does take a long time. So. I tell my patients that they'll hate me for the first week and then they'll start feeling a lot better after that just to, because this is a surgery that you know, when any time that you take bone away, it, it definitely is, is painful. But I would tell you that I've, uh, I've probably done 25, a couple dozen here since I've been here since August and um, everyone's, a, everyone's a little bit different, but in general, people have been thrilled with, uh, thrilled with how, how things have gone and are getting back to track I've done it in Iowa State athletes and high school athletes, and they're getting back to things that they haven't been able to do. So, so far, things have been going really well. Thanks for having me.